should be played at high volume, preferably in a residential area. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now time! Oh, no. Oh, yeah! I finished these fights. Give me a hell yeah! Top Rope Nation. Learn to love it! It's the best thing going today. What's up? What's up? What's up? Top Rope Nation episode, I believe, 206. I probably should have checked. I think it's 206. Uh, my name is Ryan Drosty here with Kyle Ross, Justin Joint, here to break down all the latest in the world of professional wrestling. And boys, no shortage of things to talk about tonight. We're really excited about this one. Kyle Ross, welcome back to your show, Top Rope Nation. How are you doing tonight? I wasn't aware I'd ever left. <laughs> It's been a long week, man. Sometimes it's like we start, we do the show Thursday night, and then like that is a long week to get to the next show. Although we might be a little more active here in the coming days, which we'll be talking about here in just a minute. <laughs> yeah, to be honest, since the last time we've done a podcast, the European Super League has both started and folded. <laughs> yes, <laughs> much to Justin's delight, right? Yeah, I, I, I was going to put out an actual press release, uh, but I guess I just announced it here that I am starting a Top Rope Nation Super League podcast where it's just me and my takes. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, I'd be down for it. A little spinoff podcast. Why not? <laughs> Maybe I am, per- I, I am going to need you to do all the recording and engineering and sound <laughs> mixing and you know all that stuff. Yeah, it's just like, hey, man, just mix this for me and I'll just spout off in European soccer for an hour. <laughs> just I need this. I need this release. Justin, how are you doing, by the way, man? Well, how's your week going? Good, good. Uh, no complaints uh, other than, you know, when I have to watch WWE television. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, man, my week has been going very well. Because Excuse me. For the f- <laughs> because for the first time in over one year, I got to sit down with Mr. Yeah. Justin Joint in Ooh. person this last weekend and have a couple beers have some food. It was a good time. Great to see you, Justin. I, I don't I don't know if it was my age or probably the overindulgence. I shouldn't have had that third IPA because I came home and zonked out at a, a great afternoon nap. I was tired. And then I took my kids <laughs> to the park somehow. <laughs> but yeah, dude, that was fun. Now, the, if you're watching the video feed, you see Justin wearing the Top Rope Nation snapback, which I gave him at our outing last weekend. So he finally got that hat. Got a couple of people in our Facebook group that purchased the ones that I had left. Uh, and so uh, I, I'm probably going to order a few more hats in the future. So if you want one, it'll be a different design. Make sure you join the Top Rope Nation Pro Wrestling Discussion Group over on Facebook.com. You can find uh, the link here in the description. If you're joining us tonight on YouTube.com, or even after the fact, make sure you hit that subscribe button, thumbs up the video, leave us a comment, let us know what you think about the topics that we are about to discuss tonight. And of course, we're available wherever podcasts are found. That includes Podbean, Stitcher, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, anywhere. TopRopeNation.com, which by the way, just had a little redesign. Check that out. I haven't even told my co-hosts about that. Yeah, TopRopeNation.com is... I completely redesigned the website last weekend, so that's completely different now. So check it out in your free time. Nice little hub for all of our links to merchandise, the podcast feed, the YouTube feed, the Patreon, which, by the way, I should mention next week, we will be doing our monthly Patreon bonus show over, what was it, the April 21st, 1997, I believe, edition of Monday Night Raw, which is one of the best Raws of 97, which is a pretty renowned year. I'm actually excited to watch Raw. It's going to be the first time in a while. It's going to be fun. So you guys will, you're going to hear that uh, preview on a regular feed next Friday. But if you want to hear the whole show, sign up, become a patron, patreon.com slash top rope nation, all kinds of bonus content, including a new feature coming next week. Kyle Ross. What do you think about this locker room deal? We're going to be starting next week. I broke the news on our Facebook group. First time we've talked about it on air uh locker room should be a lot of fun it's going to be me and kyle unfortunately justin doesn't have an iphone so he won't be able to participate yet although they're supposed to be adding android soon uh your initial thoughts kyle on what we're going to be doing with locker room and then i will kind of explain it i'll tell you what man we're going to bring all the candy back to the locker room 
<laughs> <laughs> yes. We're, yeah. we're getting the boys their candy again, man. <laughs> so if, if you haven't heard of Locker Room, it's kind of like Clubhouse. It's an audio app. Like I said, it's, it's only available right now on uh, Apple devices. But basically, it's a way to do live shows. It's almost like a radio show. We're going to be doing a show once per week with Locker Room. We just signed a deal with them through August where they're going to have us on and doing an exclusive show to Locker Room once per week. Um, make sure you sign up, download it on your iPhones, follow me on there. It's at rdrosty, D-R-O-S-T-E, or follow Kyle at TRP Kyle. And when we go live, you'll get a notification and then you'll know we're on there. And basically, it's it's going to be like a radio show. We're going to be able to take callers it's going to be very freewheeling, just whatever is on your mind. We're going to talk about anything going on in the wrestling world at the time. We'll try to get to like a set schedule as we move forward with this. Right now, I don't know exactly when when it's going to be. We're still deciding, but we're going to start next week. After the fact, if you're not able to join us on Locker Room, I will have the audio file from it, and I'm going to release that weekly on our Patreon feed as a bonus show. So there's Ooh. another incentive, yes, to join the Patreon show. Yes, you can hear the show live, but most of you probably aren't going to tune in each and every time. So if you want to hear it on demand, the only place for that will be Patreon. Although the first show I will release kind of as a teaser in full to our regular feed. But yeah, download the Clubhouse app. Check out Patreon. Ryan Huffman in the chat right now. Sign up, people. It's legit. He's a, he's a loyal Patreon subscriber. Of Hello, Top Ryan. Liberation. And another patron is with us tonight, Camillo says awesome can't wait great show guys he has been a long time supporter of this show so can't thank you enough for that more time to rant about pro wrestling <laughs> yeah camille says he's he's ready he's got the locker room app already downloaded he's subscribed he is ready to go um so i'm ready to go fellas oh, i knew you were to gonna say about. that <laughs> you know the transitions after almost five years <laughs> you can read my mind before i'm going to say it Last week, Kyle, me and you jumped on the air in the afternoon right when the AEW ratings came out to talk about it. They popped their second biggest viewership ever last week. So all eyes were on AEW Dynamite this week to see, could they follow it up? Are they going to hold that audience? Was it just a curiosity factor or are they actually going to have you know that bigger audience now that they're no longer going head, head to head with NXT? And they held most of them uh, last week. They did a 1.219 million viewership this week, 1.104. Uh, the demo rating down slightly last week among 18 to 49 year olds was a 0.44 last week. This week, 0.37. Both weeks, good for number two overall on cable television. And so, I mean, I'll go to Kyle first because you were on the line with me last week. Your initial reactions to AEW holding strong in the ratings. Well, obviously, we're not you know, doing the show earlier in the day this week because the rating's down and we're very biased towards AEW. So there's no <laughs> denying that. Just more proof, once again. Uh, no, <laughs> but in all seriousness, uh, yeah, I figured it would be down a little bit, I guess. Um, the Challenge, which was the number one show, interestingly enough, its demo was up in almost identical margin to what AEW was down. I don't know if we should read too much into that, but it probably is something. Uh, it was the finale, the season finale of that particular show. So it will be interesting now moving forward, is AEW going to own cable on Wednesday nights? And two weeks from now, we brought this up last week, they've got that blood and gut show, a destination show, as they now call it, in the business. Uh, what can that do? I think certainly expectations will be sky high and many, uh, you know, AEW supporters will want it to beat that number from last week. Uh, and certainly I think uh, it could. Yeah. I mean, that's that's what will be really interesting is that certainly next week, but definitely in two weeks for Blood and Guts, if they can if they can pull number one on cable overall, I mean, that's going to be pretty big moment i you know we've seen both companies go up in the ratings since they've no longer been going head to head nxt they did eight hundred and forty one thousand viewers this week which is above what they were doing on wednesday nights uh they did a 0.23 demo rating but nxt was number 27 on cable on tuesday night uh, now certainly there was a lot of cable news going on yes on tuesday night so that dropped them but i mean aw being 
number two overall two weeks in a row is pretty huge. I mean, we ha we had the the video last week on our YouTube feed. Should WWE be worried? And you know, as we said on the show, they're not really worried about AEW per se because they're making tons of money. But I mean. I mean, what do you think about this, Justin? Because we were talking off air about how you look forward to watching AEW, not really the WWE product right now. We don't think AEW is going to put WWE out of business or anything like that. We're not crazy. But, I mean, do you think that they should be worried about this up-and-coming company in any fashion? What are your thoughts? No, I, I can't imagine any reason why they would be scared of AEW. In fact, I think Jericho being on uh, Stone Cold's podcast is a pretty clear signal that uh, if Vince is not scared, scared of AEW, he is certainly unaware <laughs> you know um yeah so yeah no threat um it, it's just fun to have an alternative you know in a, in a pretty consistently good show too and you know the, the surprising thing about that rating for me is you know last week coming off the the heels of a kind of a ho-hum show and the the last two weeks have been really good and that's kind of without anything to really hook you or make you really want want to watch the next week's shows. It's, it's just the fact that it's it's a solid two hour wrestling show. Yeah, I thought this week was interesting because they focus so much on like the younger, lesser known stars. You know, like last week we talked about they had Mike Tyson on the show. Uh, and this week it was all about the young talent, really. And it didn't matter. I mean, they still they still popped a big rating. I thought the first hour of the show again was like awesome, top to bottom. I thought it slowed down a little bit in the second hour, but it's still a really good show overall. But that first hour, man, I mean, they start out with a great opener again. I thought towards the end of the first hour, the uh, the Ty Conti match with Sheeta was awesome too. We could, I mean, that could be a whole show right there talking about how WWE let cool. Ty Conti get away. <laughs> I mean, you invest that much in your developmental system. And you let someone with that kind of athletic background get away. She's she's already way better now than she was when she was with WWE, but she still had a high ceiling and they just kind of gave up and she was frustrated and, you know, they let her walk. Yeah, I remember when AEW picked her up. I think I tweeted this is a good pickup for mm -hmm. AEW because, you know, I always look for people within the WWE system that are frustrated. That tells me that, you know, they're hungry for more. They're motivated. And like you said, here she goes. She's out of that PC, and she's just way better. Mm -hmm. Like, look at her matches. Like, she did not have matches like this. Granted, she didn't get this kind of platform in NXT, but she's just performing way better. It's almost like night and day. Yeah. You, you got to wonder what they're doing at the PC. Um, you, you, you talked about, you know, the younger guys. I mean, it was a tremendous showcase last night, uh, I guess probably two nights ago by the time the folks are listening to this, most people, for the – not only the future, but the present of AEW. You mentioned the first match. We should talk about the last match, too, with Darby and Jungle Boy. Darby put into a main event position two weeks in a row. Um, I think that's key. That shows a lot of belief in him. Uh, yeah, so I, I thought top to bottom it was a good show, to Justin's point, about like not having that big hook, really, either of those two weeks. He's right. Um, you know, Double or nothing is what now? About a month, a little over a month or what? Yeah, yeah. And there's really no strong indication what the main event of that show is going to be, is there? Mm. Or like, like, what is the main event? I mean, we have the elite, right? The Bucks just turned. That is kind of the main event angle. And, you know, Moxley and Kingston have their issue with, you know, the whole elite group. But like, you know, what is the key match they're building to? right now in AEW. I you'd assume that after Blood and Guts it's MJF and Chris Jericho again is really the only high profile one I could think of. Do we think cuz they can't run Moxley and Omega again. I m me thinks I was thinking about this, you know, earlier today. Are they kind of protecting the Omega Rich Swan match for yeah, Impact I think and that's so why too. they're not and that's why they're not yeah. announcing anything. I think I think so. Which also is kind of odd that they didn't really promote that show at all. <laughs> you know, but yeah. I don't know. Tony Tony Khan was kind of big time in them a little bit, you know, yeah. talking about how hey, he's paying to be on impact. And if they want to be, a, you know, they can pay for <laughs> advertisements on AEW. But yeah, I mean, you would think 
when you have your world champion in a pay-per-view match this weekend, you might mention it a little bit, but they didn't. But I think, yeah, definitely probably protecting the Swan Omega match. Yeah. Do you think they're going back to Christian Cage? I guess I mean, remember they had him come out. What was that? Maybe his first week on Dynamite. He looked, he picked the title up, looked at it, and then there's been nothing with Omega and him since then. I'm just wondering, like, you, you've got to have Kenny Omega in a world title match on that show. I, I, get I wonder the, if they go back to that. I, I get the feeling with Christian Cage, they're doing the slow burn. I mean, yeah. he, he mm-hmm. even said as much that he doesn't just want the title shot. He wants to earn it. And mm-hmm. I, I can't assume, like, a month, two months of matches is going to be enough. Yeah. But, yeah. I mean, who knows? Yeah, there's not, There doesn't seem to be a whole lot of other options. Yeah, I mean, and they're doing the thing with him and Team Taz. Obviously, I don't know if he's going to keep going through, but I, I wish Team Taz would win more. I know they do on the other shows on Dark and Elevation, but I like Team Taz a lot, yeah. especially Hook, possibly a future world champion <laughs> in this business. <laughs> Hook could be the guy. Um, Ricky Starks, thank God he's okay, by the way. Yeah, Ooh, he man. almost came close to not being able to walk anymore. Yeah, yeah, that was, that was scary. Um, that main event you mentioned, Kyle. So what did you guys think of that? We got Camille in the tra- chat saying Jungle Boy will be the new TNT champion soon. I think with Jungle Boy, it's going to be interesting to watch over the next couple of years because I think uh, I think the Jungle Boy gimmick will go away and he'll just become Jack Perry, you know, eventually. Um, but uh, he's a rising star. Or we've talked about him since the start of AEW. I mean, he's got the pedigree. You know, he's from a famous family, obviously. Mm-hmm. He looks this is an optics business he looks good on tv he can work he's got some star power he's got connections i think this is a guy who definitely at some point should be tnt champion well and most importantly literally every time after he makes his entrance and the match starts i have to go to youtube and replay his entrance music he does have a great so theme good. Song. Oh. i knew that's where you're going yeah, and that's the key. it's funny you know when you said eh, maybe they'll tone down the jungle boy thing but you know you've got to lean it that's the whole thing with the entrance there. So they got to keep that. But, you know, it is fascinating. Like I mentioned to my wife, I'm like, oh, do you know who Jungle Boy's dad is? And she says, no, which is, I assume <laughs> that was going to be the answer. And I was like, Luke Perry. And she yep. said, what? That's crazy. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, it's it's a real interesting tidbit. Um, You know, and, you know, obviously, you know, there's going to be people out there. Oh, why don't you mention that, you know, guys like Billy Gunn and Sting are on the, they're not spring chickens or Jericho. Yeah, we know that. but. For the most part, I mean, in the key positions of that show, it was um, kind of people given the opportunity to sink or swim, so to speak, right? You had mm-hmm. Paige and Starks open, Conti and Sheeta at the top of the hour, and then Darby and Jungle Boy um, main evented. So, uh, by the way, I, I mentioned my wife, Billy Gunn, was 57 years old. She goes, he looks way better than that Undertaker. <laughs> and, 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 and then and then goes quote she should or uh he he should beat him billy gunn should beat the undertaker <laughs> I, I i told her would not be a popular booking decision in most wrestling circles but hey you can go for it i'd laugh get cammy on this podcast yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's got the real hot takes in that household. Yeah, yeah. My actually, my wife brought up one time. She was like, "We should do a podcast sometime where all the spouses came on with you guys. That would be kind of entertaining. <laughs> Some uh, kind of bonus show." Yeah, you, know, you know, to nitpick a little bit, was Chris Jericho drunk in that promo? Dude, that I mean, I know, promo. I know, I'm drinking. I mean, full disclosure, <laughs> I am drinking right now. So I'm not. <laughs> I'm not saying he's wrong if he was, but yeah, I, I, I don't know that. I don't it was so weird because like at first after I it was like he got done with that promo with the inner circle and I just kind of sat there and I was like (laughs) I don't really know what to think right now because like the way he delivered it he was like so crazy and maniacal and just screaming and yelling and I was like was that okay like was that (laughs) decent and then I was like that really wasn't very good, was it? But it was like it was like this weird reaction where like he was super intense. But like I watched the show late and I already seen the tweets that people were posting of like his bloodshot eyes and stuff. So I was kind of thinking that like, is he on something right? Like, is he do you have a few drinks backstage? Yeah. What's going on? But it was it was pretty bizarre. It it had the feeling of somebody who had no plan going in, but was 
uh, overconfident and that they could just, you know, wing it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, it, I thought Santana outdid him. I thought his little bit, yeah. he had that was intense and was great. And man, you know, Sammy Guevara was such a key part of the whole split that led to this inner circle pinnacle feud. I'd like to see him get a little more focus in the yeah. coming weeks and months. Right. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't For mind sure. seeing him work MJF at the pay-per-view to yeah. be honest with you. Hey, uh, real quick, since we're on inner circle thoughts on them, uh, uh basically the entire blood and guts night is going to just be solely focused on that one match. Uh, cause for one, I think that's pretty cool to really build it up. But at the same time, a bit of a missed opportunity to not have some matches with the two rings. True. Yeah. I'm like really curious how they're going to structure that show. You know, like how are they going to do a full two hour show with one? I'm sure the match will get plenty of time. I I hope they have a lot of pre-tapes that are pretty creative and cool, like heading into it, Uh, how they prepared for the match, like make it very sports oriented. Make it seem like a big deal. Yeah, it's going to be that is I am really intrigued with that show, though. Like, that's a pretty ballsy decision to do a two hour show with one match. You know, they were supposed to do this last year uh, and then the pandemic derailed everything. You I may think, have heard. Yeah, I, I think actually it might have been the first time he mentioned because I was at the press scrum at Revolution. And I think I remember Tony Khan talking about it there, uh, but he, he was being very careful to not call it war games. Uh, and then, yeah, now it's, you know, on a year delay, I'm looking forward to it. And from just a match standpoint, but also creatively, how is this going to work? But yeah, if you're getting, if you're doing that big viewership to Justin's point, like you would think that you would want to get some other guys on that card to elevate them a little bit in case you get that huge audience. But I don't know. It it is a risky decision. It, I I think it should pay off just from the hype. We'll see. And, And plus, you know, I think back to the fall brawl undercards in WCW with the cruiserweights and how they utilize the two rings. That was always a cool deal. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, 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 you know, AEW obviously has a lot of high flyers, the Ray Phoenixes of the world. And it'd be kind of sweet to see them do that, but we shall see. I like unique. I am mm-hmm. so desperate for unique in wrestling in 2021. So if they can successfully pull off a one mat show on a two hour weekly TV program, Bravo and a tip of the cap. And if it doesn't work, we'll of course criticize it. Yeah, <laughs> we're we're fair on the show. We're objective. We will. We've criticized AEW in the past. I know we've been very high on them for the last couple of weeks, and rightfully so. But we've also given them a hard time when they've been at low points. So, like the we'll last see. pay-per-view. Yeah, <laughs> this, is why you, this is why you tune into the show. We're objective with the listeners. Perhaps you heard me talking. say it's not fucking good, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I mean, yeah. Go back and listen to our pay-per-view post show. After this year's revolution, that's all you need. We were we were depressed. <laughs> oh, okay, you know I, I do want to talk about one kind of big picture thing with AEW. Uh, as I scan my own notes and remembered, I really wanted to say this. You know, a, a key for AEW compared to WWE is that in most cases with AEW, I am left with wanting to see more of the individual talent. You know, it's almost like, God, I wish I could see more of this guy. You know, I, I hope he does something. God, I, I could see big things for him. You know, like this Anthony Agogo, for instance, or something. Like, I, I love this one punch gimmick they're doing mm-hmm. with him. Or, or Jade Cargill, or, you know, just anybody. I mean, even Adam Page, a guy who's like really featured a lot. I'm like, God, I would love to, you know, see more of him. And maybe you hear me say that, and you don't think it's, that big of a deal. You know, I mean, AEW's got this big roster, just like WWE. So, oh, naturally, you know, hey, well, they've got a lot of guys that are trying to put them all on TV. You're going to want to see more guys. But WWE, I mean, how many people in that promotion are overexposed, a jobber to the stars, or both? Where it's like, <laughs> d- like the, yeah. the, the, the vast majority of WWE talent, I don't want to see more of them. In all due respect, I mean, th- there's a lot of talented folks in that promotion, but they've either been rendered mid card for life or they're just on too much. Yeah. So it's yeah, very the- different. Well, no, you know, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Not only not only that, but something especially on on this most recent show is like they really mix up the finishes well too. You know, you look at the the ending of the Page and Starks match, um, which normally you know. If it's not interference, the baby faces went in with their finisher. I mean, 
Adam Page broke that move kind of out of nowhere. And um, same, same with Darby winning with the, the last supper pin. And speaking of that match, you know, two of possibly their, their biggest future stars, homegrown, headlining the show. You know, I don't think in a million years WWE has a normal finish to that match. There, there's going to be interference before there's a pinfall. We had a clean, clean finish before we got all the inter- interference. You don't say about the interference. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got something to say about that. But huh. you know, I mean, WWE, it's amazing when you look at you know because we talked about this with the roster cuts a little bit last week, Ryan, that, Hey, you know, when people say, Oh my God, such, such promotions, too many people, you know, under contract. Well, then you get roster cuts, but AEW. Yeah. Sometimes maybe there's too much going on and they do try to feature everybody. And, and, you know, if you try to feature everybody, sometimes, you know, you don't get that one big star, you know, it's you know, kind of like a football. If you have two quarterbacks, you don't have any, but with AEW, I like I said, I'm left wanting more with the majority of the talent. WWE, like I've never seen a larger roster of more irrelevant people in the history of this business. Like the vast majority of that roster is just not believable in a main event role anymore because of how they've been booked over the course of three, four, six years. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you definitely see more names on the rise that you could see being that guy someday, being that woman someday, as we saw with Tay Conti on Wednesday night. We haven't even mentioned the MJF promo, which was like a massive highlight, too. I mean, good God, MJF, this guy. Uh, And what they did with Wardlow, with him saying, he's like, oh, Jericho, on your promo that everyone thought was so cool, I noticed you slipped up when you got to me, you must be scared of me. That was so cool how they did that, how they took something that happened and then they, that that wasn't supposed to happen because Jericho flubbed his line and they wove it into the storyline. That's something WWE doesn't do. Mm -hmm. So is MJF in your eyes, is this guy a perennial world champion within a couple of years? After Omega, he would be a logical next heel champion. Mm-hmm. Agreed. Agreed. So let's shift gears to SmackDown. Because Kyle, <laughs> we've been talking. Justin's like, all right, let's hear this. Um, WWE television following WrestleMania. I mean, we talked a little bit last week. It's not good, right? <laughs> oh boy so let's go back to smackdown so we're establishing cesaro now as the next challenger you would think to roman reigns uh he works jay uso in the main event he's given jay uso the swing out comes seth rollins a couple of forearm shivers to the back of the head kyle ross your thoughts (laughs) one good was it so (laughs) Okay, let's back up to the start of the show. Actually, let's back up several weeks on this podcast. I believe I said, okay, Rollins is obviously going to lose to Cesaro. He's going to put him... You got the sense that Rollins really wanted to put Cesaro over at WrestleMania. Mm -hmm. And that's cool, whatever. But I also said... Sorry. (laughs) That's my phone. <laughs> trying okay, to share uh, the video out in the group. Uh, okay. okay, sorry. That, that, that threw me off here. I heard my mom. I was like, God, who's that tool? I'm like, oh, dear God, it's me. <laughs> um, anyway, so I said, okay, that's fine and dandy. Rollins is going to, or Cesaro is going to get his WrestleMania win. But who wants to bet that, like, Rollins is going to get a world title shot before Cesaro? Oh, man. Okay, remember I said oh, that. God. Yeah. Okay, and... Well, lo and behold, who answers the tribal chief at the start of SmackDown? Cesaro. Mm, Okay. All right. By the way, I I believe, Justin, you've mentioned this in the past. We need a music change for this Cesaro. Yeah. It's it's a lot better than it used to be. 
Uh, but yeah, it's still it, it's it's not fucking good, Kyle. <laughs> it, 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 it could it's be a lot of, better. Yeah, it, it, I don't know. It's sort of reminiscent of like Perry Saturn in two thousand. You know, <laughs> like or just like very generic. <laughs> oh, uh, anyway, it's it is better than American Alpha. Well, I mean, yes. So is <laughs> Bob Backlund's theme in nineteen ninety four. Yes. Uh, he had no music just for those keeping <laughs> um, it. Andre the Giant, yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so Cesaro comes out. Roman kind of blows him off, which is fine. It fits his character. But, you know, they go backstage and Cesaro wants the match with Roman. I, I believe he talked to uh, uh, Adam Pierce and Sonya Deville first. And then, you know, they go to Heyman. Heyman cuts a promo and sort of buried Cesaro. Okay, I don't know if I like that. And we get a Jay Uso match out of it because, of course, Cesaro is not on Roman's level. He must go through Jay Uso first. Okay. I, thinking to myself, kind of been there, done that with every SmackDown babyface that goes after Roman, right? You got to go through Jay Uso first. But at least Cesaro's getting the win, right? Tonight. Mm -hmm. So, you know, hey, a second big win for Cesaro in a row. Nope. <laughs> because as you pointed out, Ryan. Rollins interferes, and I guess we're going back to that feud. So my point is this. If you're going to do that finish, and it was a horrible finish. It was such weak interference. Like, you're right. He just gave him, like, a couple forearm shivers, Rollins. Mm -hmm. And then he ran to the top of the ramp and just started emoting or whatever the fuck he was doing. I mean, it was very bad. <laughs> I'm not done with you. I was like, oh, no. He, he was fiending. Yeah, it, it was very bad. <laughs> and so if you're going to do that finish, why not just make your TV a little bit more compelling and have Cesaro work Reigns as the TV main event? In True. the sense that, like, because it's like, if you're a Cesaro fan, I know you guys are both big Cesaro fans. Not that I'm not. I love the man's work. I've just kind of given up any hope that he's, you know, going to do something meaningful in this promotion. So it's like, you're kind of disappointed, though, if you're a Cesaro fan, that you're getting a Jey Uso match when he asked for Roman, right? Again, think from a fan's perspective. Mm -hmm. But in the back of your head, you're like, well, at least he's going to win. Well, not only did he not get the big match, he didn't win. So it's like, it's kind of like a double kick in the gonads. Um, so, I mean, at least if, you know, you're doing Cesaro and Roman, you could do a thing where, oh my God, Cesaro had Roman Reigns beat and that freaking Seth Rollins interfered. You get actual heat, Yeah, you know, on Rollins. This just feels like heat on the promotion. I thought an absolutely <laughs> abhorrent finish to Friday Night SmackDown. And I'd be less critical. Okay, but do we really have faith that the WWE is going to play a successful long game with Cesaro here? That he's going to, you know, beat Rollins again, and that he's going to move on and beat Jey Uso when they have some inevitable rematch? And for the record, I think we all know he ain't beat Roman Reigns anyway, which is a big picture. Mm. Uh, thing. So I just wanted to share that. I, I thought it was just absolute trash booking kind of what you just laid out is is what i hope happens we, we, he gets another win over rollins beats jay uso and then hopefully you can get maybe maybe two pay-per-views against roman reigns and i and you know huge cesaro fan here i don't think there's any world in which he should beat roman reigns for the world title right now um but they could put on awesome matches the promos would probably be a problem. I, I wasn't really offended by anything except for when Cesaro came back and gave the interview about what Heyman had called him, like about having Neanderthal arms or something like that. It's like, <laughs> come on, man. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Has it come to this though, where wrestling fans are just like the bar is so low that we're just like, I just hope our favorite has a good match. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, mean, I, I don't want to sound like, you know, fucking Cornette here, but that's kind of like sad, you know, also sad. And I don't know what to make of this, but I know you guys, uh, Ryan, I believe it was you on the Twitter feed took umbrage with, you know, Goldberg talking about Cesaro, but you've got like Jerry Lawler. I think this was on the WrestleMania pre-show. Well, you know, I think fans are just finally starting to get into this Cesaro. They didn't really know how good he was before now. And it's like, <laughs> what? 
Wait, <laughs> like he's been around for how long? Yeah. What What did Bill say about Cesaro? I didn't see that. He put him over and said he'd like to work with him. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I've always liked that Goldberg. Yeah, I've there always we go. said that he's a good guy. Great yeah. in the ring. Now, why do you think it was me that took issue with that, Kyle? Because you panned Goldberg. You took. <laughs> <laughs> All right, totally it was yeah, I know it was. <laughs> so, but like, I, I laugh so hard at this like notion. I think fans are just getting into Cesaro. Motherfucker, people were begging for this guy <laughs> to get a push seven years ago. Seven yeah. years ago, I did not have a child. I was not married. I weighed about thirty less pounds. <laughs> um, you know, I smoked didn't know me more. yet. No, Didn't this podcast hasn't yet. even started yet. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that fans are just getting into Cesaro. The goal Jesus. of this promotion. And, and, you, <laughs> and you know, Lawler didn't. Well, maybe he came up with that on the top of his head. I, I kind of hope he did, actually. If somebody like fed him that line, that's hideous. <laughs> you know, it, to, to your point about Cesaro and Rollins, it feels like you could go two routes with how they do this. And of course they went the route that is like less engaging. I think for me and all of us, you could look at this like, okay, we want Cesaro to be the next challenger. We've got what a month until the next pay-per-view uh, WrestleMania backlash. They're calling it now May 16th. Uh, so we got like four or five weeks to kill. We could either build up Cesaro week to week to be like a challenger, putting him over strong that you think could actually take on Roman Reigns. Or we could kill some time by like keeping him wrestling Seth Rollins for a few weeks. And it feels like they're, they went with the second option. He's going to continue wrestling Seth Rollins. He'll beat him again. And then they'll be like, now he's earned that championship shot against Roman Reigns. And it's going to be like, he beat him at WrestleMania. We just yeah. wasted like three weeks on this. Yeah. I mean, like a WrestleMania win <laughs> should be a big deal. Like, it should be enough, right? And, uh, you know, man, you guys got a lot more faith in this WWE than I do. Okay? I'm not convinced Cesaro's winning a rematch against Seth Rollins, and I'm not convinced that that rematch isn't taking place at WrestleMania Backlash. And they're well, not going in a different direction for Roman at that show. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised to see him do two Rollins matches on SmackDown in the interim. Rollins gets his revenge. There's your 50-50. Then, then they're like, all right, let's have the rubber match. Winner gets the shot at Roman or something, and then then Cesaro wins. Like I could see him just scripting out the next few weeks, and this is how we're going to kill time for four weeks or whatever. Killing we'll time. The <laughs> it seems like that's how they look at television, television, isn't it? Yes, yes. Well, Killing uh, time. The the problem is on the on the flip side. If if you wanted the clean finish with Cesaro just beating Jay Uso, and therefore showing Roman Reigns he deserves a match, you you can't put Cesaro on the mic to hype up the match for, you know, however long you're going to wait till you actually do it. I mean, you do kind of have, that's the problem with Cesaro. You kind of have to drag it out in certain see, ways. See, But that's a problem I have with all modern, you know, we talked about double or nothing. I'm being fair to ever. I love the idea of a main event being announced with plenty of lead time and being hyped to death. If, we can't do that anymore in wrestling. I just wonder why. Like, why can't we just, like, UFC does these big pay-per-views, right, for these matches. And I know it's not apples to apples, right? They don't have the weekly TV and all the hours of content to fill. Mm. But, and I'm not saying they should announce these matches six months in advance. But, man, like, I think just dragging it out. Oh, what's the main event going to be at the next show? Like, you wonder why there's no attraction of casual fans. That's why. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. But because, like, like I, I just think that, like, I, I know what you're saying, Justin. That's the way they do things, WWE. But, like, I, I just want to see main events announced and hyped to death. And if you feel that, well, we're not confident we can hype this, then what the hell are you doing in the wrestling business? <laughs> to be quite frank. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, I, I don't know. Do you guys have any more on Shark? Because, uh, Cesaro, because I got something to say about Charlotte now. Yeah, let's go to Charlotte because they did this angle with Charlotte. You know, she's been back now for two weeks. I think the heel character she's been doing has been really good. I've enjoyed her promos. I I feel like she's played heel before, but she's come back with kind of an edge and a little like ramped up a notch from her previous heel characters. I feel like, and uh, you know, she comes out, she gets involved in this main event match. Or, or she wrestles in the main event this week, I should say, against Asuka. 
There's the distraction finish with Rhea Ripley, and then Charlotte goes nuts and attacks the referees. She gets suspended, storyline suspension. Uh, apparently, from what I was hearing, she's going to be off to have some kind of dental surgery for a while. I don't know how, like, what the recovery period is for what's going on, but that was the last I heard was that she was having some kind of dental surgery. Uh, at least, at least that, maybe more. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, there was a real hubbub on Twitter today with you know people taking Dave. Yeah. Meltzer's comments out of context because for simply pointing out what everyone has known since the beginning of time, it's a cosmetic business. I mean, I, I don't think you know people should be dragged through the mud for pointing that out. Quite frankly, was that was that his big point? I don't, I, I missed this too. Yeah, I mean, he basically put it out as a cosmetic business, right? That, oh, like, you yeah. know, it, it was like it was something about that she was self conscious about her looks or something. Was that the thing, Ryan? Mm -hmm. am, I, am I getting? Yeah, it you're right. right. You're right. Okay. You're right. Wait, no, isn't there somebody in the company who's basically their biggest superstar who came back with some shiny new whites? Roman yes. Reigns had yeah. his teeth done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, I don't know what is going on, but like. I, to be honest, I don't even care. I mean, I, I hope she's, you know, I, I wish her, you know, great health and I hope everything's good. But this was another finish to a show that just had me scratching my head. So wasn't she just off TV? <laughs> Why would you bring her back for two weeks just to write her off again? Is I know. The, that's what was bizarre. Yeah. Is the left hand not speaking to the right in Stanford, Connecticut <laughs> yet again? I mean, I know. Ryan, you talked about the promos. They're not bad. I, I thought the one with Asuka, you, it could have, you know, the whole, like, you know, what she was like, talking about how Asuka speaks or it was, was bad. But um, that's a different story for a different day. But not only was the finish on Monday night extraordinarily awkward with a heel losing due to interference. Mm -hmm. I didn't like that at all. Um, but it was yet another failure to learn from history by – you know, those coming up with these finishes. This whole notion of flipping out, quote unquote, and attacking WWE officials, that's no longer an effective means to get someone over as a heel. And it goes back to the attitude era that they love to promote so much. As that era, as I check my notes here, established that kind of behavior as a baby face move. As a matter of fact, later in this podcast, we are going to talk about someone who had a documentary made about them who made a career out of stunning authority figures. And look no further than Survivor Series 2019 when they tried this same deal with Charlotte and she got cheered against Ronda Rousey. Remember when she went crazy at the end <laughs> yeah. of the match? I, and, and what's really sad this time, I mean, I know there's no live crowd. You got the Thunderdome, but like the cheers have just been replaced with total indifference on the booking and that's just w what you don't want. Um, so I, I just don't know what they're thinking. Like, why would you heat up Charlotte like that after a loss, you know, when she's been only back on TV for two weeks? Yeah. I mean, that was my thought too, is when I first heard about it, she's taken some time off for this. What, what the hell did she come back for in the first place then under then? I guess the thought was they could get more heat on her since she's been away. I, I don't know, but yeah, it, it doesn't, it really doesn't make a lot of sense. Like, like our, you know, and the way that WWE treats its officials, totally nameless, literally nameless folks, right? Like there was always also that Vince don't mention their names. Mm -hmm. So there's no like personal attachment to these referees at all they're just people counting one two three in the ring like is anybody sitting out there i would love to hear for the people you know in the chat room like is anyone sitting there's like oh my god i can't believe that charlotte flair that was totally over the line that bitch nobody's <laughs> saying that this is like the most outdated way to try to like get heel heat i've ever seen well, it just it just didn't work well there are those people but at the time we're recording this around 10 central time, it, it's kind of past their bedtime. <laughs> I guess. Yeah. I mean, I don't know, man. Even kids like to me, it's just like, it's a baby face move. When you flip out attack. I mean, you know, I mean, it goes back to, you know, Ken Shamrock. I mean, I'm not saying this is that, but I mean, it's just, I thought it was terrible. Just terrible. 
Yeah, I not a huge fan of it. Either. Overall, Raw I thought was uh, pretty dreadful. I'm also not a huge fan. I mean, I know we're only two weeks into the experiment, but Adnan Verk, not a fan so far. I mean, I'm I'm not sure that this is a type of role like everyone's saying. I'll oh, take it easy on him. He just started, but like, why do they hire people that are growing into the job like live Thank on you. air on a three week show? It doesn't make any sense. So I have no sympathy for. Hey, you're. <laughs> Well, Give him a couple of weeks. We shouldn't be on the flagship show of the WWE then. <laughs> Thank you. Th- that is such a key point because I actually don't blame him at all. No, he's, I mean, he's, yeah. He's being thrown to the deep end, like you said, yeah. right? And it's funny. It just, it speaks to how WWE views commentary, right? Just totally replaceable people. Oh, we'll just throw any person with a broadcasting background behind the microphone and They'll do just fine. And, you know, I, I just think back, and I know I'm more of a commentary guy maybe than both of you. I mean, Justin's actually, in, in the past, you've talked about how you're able to block out yeah, commentary. Power. Um, Special um, talent. But, yeah. um, you know, I think of all the my favorite matches in the history of this business. I can tell you who the commentators were. Commentary is, to me, such, can be such a value add to the presentation. And, and WWE just doesn't treat it that way. I mean, what was the last bit of quality commentary in a match that you could think of? Seriously. Oh, I mean, it's Joe not- was Joe was good. They let him go. He, <laughs> he, he was, was by good, far the best. But, like, what is like the last like oh my, like WWE match you think of that? Oh, that match had great commentary. You know, like you, you think of you know I'll just pick something easy that everyone remembers. Like Hell in a Cell with Foley and Undertaker. Everyone remembers Jim Ross's call. In that match, the, the the famous lines, you know, oh my God, he must be broken. Is God is my witness? He's broken half, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Like now, like there's just no personality to these announcers. You know, say what you will about you know Gorilla Monsoon and Jesse Ventura back in the day. Those guys felt like authorities on wrestling when you listen to them. Yeah, and you know, it's not just WWE because it's funny. I mentioned Ed Van Verk on our show last week, Ryan, when we were doing it, I was like, you know, compared to a lot of the other ESPN guys, I didn't mind him when he was with baseball tonight. But ESPN kind of does the same thing as WWE with its uh, flagship show, Sports Center. I mean, how many people on that are just like nameless and faceless now? Like, you, you turn on Sports Center, like, oh, it's that person. But you don't know their name. Whereas when we were growing up, you had those strong personalities on Sports Center. Um, it, it goes into sport, like for games too, like the NFL, NBA. You had you used to have strong announcers, and I just feel like now these TV executives don't value commentary, and I don't know why. You know what's also weird about this is that they hired a guy without extensive combat sports background, and I know wrestling's not real, but I would lump it into combat sports commentary of like how you build up the fight, the match, right? If you look in the past, they've hired people with no wrestling experience, but who came from the combat sports world, like Moro Ranallo. Well, yeah. uh, I know, I know, we have <laughs> opinions about him, but still, like he had experience there, and of course, he had called New Japan too, um, but. Also, remember, boy, this was a long, what, 15 years ago when they were going hard to try to get Mike Goldberg from UFC? I mean, there's another guy from the combat sports world. Adnan Verk is like, yeah, he's been in the sports world, but not combat sports. Like, I got to assume he knows almost nothing about professional wrestling. And, and he was a studio host at ESPN for yeah. people who aren't familiar with He was not a play. I don't think he did play by play for Sunday Night Baseball, did he? I Correct me if I'm wrong. Maybe I don't think so. I, not that I know of. I'm, but, I'll check his Wikipedia page while you're talking yeah, about yeah, it. Check me, but I, I just remember him mostly as the studio host for Baseball Tonight, which is a totally different skill set than being a play-by-play guy for a live television show. Or for yeah. a, or for an, I should say for a live wrestling show. Yeah, I mean, he was a, he was on SportsCenter for TSN early in his career. Um, it looks like... Basically all studio work. Uh, yeah, baseball tonight, ESPN, college football, studio, studio, studio. So I mean, yeah, it's, yeah. it's different. I mean, we t- even Renee Young, who we all love. You know, she is great in her role, like hosting. You know, like kind of the backs, like the studio esque WWE shows. But she struggled by her own admission when she was a color commentator. It's a he- different skill set. 
He did like a little bit of hosting of boxing events, but okay. oh, I don't know about play by play. Okay. I don't think extensively or anything. Yeah. Well, I mean, it could be worse. I mean, you know. But I mean, to me, again, it's just like a very, very bizarre hiring. Like yeah. why you hire someone for your flagship show that's like, how do you throw him out there cold? Again, like it's not his fault. He got the job. He wanted the job. But like if you don't have experience doing it, you know, how do you how do you expect it to be a success? And then to have someone growing on the job like the fan base turns on him. I don't know how that works out. Maybe maybe he'll turn around and end up being one of the greatest of all time. Who knows? But like as of right now, it hasn't been good. Um the other thing I'm gonna, I wanted to say about him is if you close your eyes for a second, and this is not an insult, I guess this is a compliment because this guy's a friend of ours. He's been on the podcast before. Close your eyes and listen to Verk talk. Sounds just like Chris Van Vliet. Their Somebody else are, said that. I read really? That. Yeah, somebody yeah. else did say that. Yes. Well, Chris Van Vliet is on the Blue Wire Network with us, friend of ours, but they their voices are very close. God, I, he does. You're right now. Oh, God, I'm not going to be able to get that out of my he head. You won't be able to unhear it now. Well, so you know, just like Chris Van Vliet. You know. uh, all right, he's, off to, he's off to a better start than General Ad Man in the WWE. We <laughs> yes, that? that's for sure. <laughs> all right, let's wrap it up with this Stone Cold Steve Austin um, documentary because we definitely want to get to this. Uh, so, I've been really looking forward to this for a long time. Uh, the the A&E, I think there's six of them. The biography shows that they're going to be doing. Two-hour show on Stone Cold eight, Steve Austin. Actually, Is it maybe eight? even nine. Yeah, it's a lot. It's quite oh, a bit. Oh, wow. So a lot of them. I and mean, we got several weeks to look at this. We've got Roddy Piper coming up this weekend. In a few weeks, they're going to be doing a Bret Hart one that I'm really looking forward to. In fact, we will be doing a Bret Hart fantasy draft in the weeks ahead. So you can look forward mm. to that. That'll be our tie-in when the, uh, the Bret Hart episode airs. Uh, so the Austin one, the first one, I mean, a really good way to kick it off. I want to get everyone's thoughts on this. Uh, overall, I have to say, kind of like I wrote in our Facebook group, I really, really enjoyed it. I don't think that these shows are necessarily written for people like us because we know the ins and outs of Austin's career like pretty well. But I think as like a broad overview of his career, plus it's new footage of him talking about it. So even though we've heard him tell these stories before, I mean... He's telling it. It's it's a it's a different sit down interview, so that always makes it a little bit more interesting to see the footage. I mean, you're talking about the biggest draw in the history of the wrestling business, just to kind of relive all that. Even though I've seen it countless times, is always an entertaining broadcast. I did think that it struggled a little bit with how they told the narrative and how it jumped around. Um, this was one of our critiques on Dark Side of the Ring which we've always been super complimentary on, except for one episode, and that was the Bret Hart episode. And Kyle, you said at the time that that one was like, just from a documentary perspective, a little bit hard to follow. Yes. And I thought with the Austin one, like the timeline, like the narrative of it got a little difficult to follow. Uh, Cause they skipped over some things. Like they didn't hardly talk at all about the Bret Hart feud. Uh, his rise just kind of happened. And then they went to the Owen injury and then like they kind of hit like the highlights of his run on top. Like they concentrate on what happened with the rock. Uh, but yeah. like it didn't really progress like in a linear fashion, which is like what I like in, in documentaries. So that was like one little nitpick I had with it. But overall, I mean, I thought for the general audience, it was extremely well done. I, I really enjoyed watching it. Uh, what do you guys think? I don't care. Either of you can go first here. I thought it was really good. I actually got a, a, a message from a buddy of mine who's not a wrestling fan, who and he knows that I am, and and, and he mentioned it and said it was really good. Um, a not, you know, you already kind of said this isn't really for us. It's not on air to teach us anything about him. Although I, I did get a little bit of new stuff. The the interviews with his family was really good, especially his his brother. Um, and then also, you know, it was really gutting when he was talking about his his being away from his daughters and how they lived in England for a while. And he was on the phone with one of them and she had an, an English accent. All of a sudden, he just kind of broke his heart. Um, so all of that was really good. I agree with you most part for, for the kind of the, the, the beats of it and maybe not so much the pacing, but the uh, the. the lengths of of stories they were telling the spaces in between you know i was shocked you know you mentioned they they didn't really hit the the brett part of it but all they showed of wrestlemania 13 you know one of the greatest moments in wrestling history 
that made him, they they almost completely skipped that too. Mm-hmm. You just had the one clip of the the bloody sharpshooter. That was yeah, it. That. Yeah, I mean, and, and that grabbed people. I, you know, Cammy was in the room watching with me. She go, "Oh my god!" It's like she like, freaked out when she saw that. It's the greatest match of all time, baby. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I had two takeaways from the documentary. You know, just to build off what you guys were saying, and I'll, I'll go back to it in a moment. It's obviously very hard. We know this to fit Steve Austin's entire career in a two hour window with commercials. I mean, my God, mm-hmm. if we, I mean, if I did, it'd be like freaking seven days long, you know, the documentary and they would tell me to get lost. But um, the, the, the two takeaways I had one, we, we know there's attitude era fatigue. I'll use that term. Maybe I don't know if that's the right term, but I'm going to use it anyway, among a subset of the current wrestling fan base. However, when you watch a documentary like this one, it is quite easy to see why that era is so revered by people. And Kevin Owens had that quote, and I didn't write down the exact quote, but I'm sure you guys know the one I'm talking about. Talking about how Austin makes it hard on them because no matter how good they are, people say, yeah, he's pretty good, but he's no Steve Austin. Yes, and yeah. you know that's the thing. And if this is a star-driven business. I know WWE now... The brand is the star, but to me, you see a documentary like this, it kind of proves that the opposite is better when there's somebody bigger than the brand, you know, Mm -hmm. I mean, because, I mean, you're not going to just want to watch, oh, like who wants to watch a documentary on WWE five hours a week just provides quality entertainment for 30 years. That's (laughs) not very interesting. I want to know about the individual personalities that make the WWE tick like Steve Austin. Um, And to that point, I got to ask you guys this, and I'm, it's a bit of a rhetorical question. Uh, I fear you're going to agree here. How important were the strong personalities of that time period, 1997, 1998? Austin, Brett, Sean, Foley, Rock, in the WWE's resurgence? Because I'm listening to this Vince McMahon talk a little bit about, uh, you know, when they first brought him in and he was the ringmaster. And it's like, yeah, I didn't really know what to do with him. I didn't think much of him at all. And I'm like, that, that was kind of a new thing to hear. I mean, we, obviously the ringmaster sucked and we've all, you know, that's been beaten to death. Um, but it was such a short fit time period, right? I yeah, mean, he was yeah. he went to Stone Cold within like three months. By um, Mania 12, he was Stone Cold. I think. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and I'm just thinking, man, if it wasn't for those guys being able to stick up for themselves, saying, nah, I'm not fucking doing this. I'm doing, this is what I want to do. And then successfully executing it. What would the WWE have been if it wasn't for that? I don't think it would have been very good, quite frankly. I think it would have been a lot of trouble at the expense of WCW in that time period. I mean, it's it's beating a dead horse, but it makes you wonder, I mean, what are the chances that they just had those giant kind of unstoppable personalities or are today's guys and gals just more handcuffed where they can't really show their real personality? Well, what's interesting is the creative team is a lot bigger now, right? So, I mean, they had a smaller group of people to potentially voice their frustrations with or to pitch a new idea. Like today, Mike, how many writers do they have? Like over 50? It's insane. I love Bruce was still trying to like defend the ringmaster idea, by the way. Yes. Oh, well, you know, he was this ring general. He was just the best. <laughs> well, I mean, I saw people making the point that if, if Steve Austin came through NXT today, they would have given up on him. And yeah, maybe there's something to that, you know, because he didn't take off right away and even have Vince on camera saying, yeah, I didn't really see anything in him. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, well, go ahead. It, you know, I would say it's just like I said earlier, it's funny, though, how quickly they course corrected. We talk about this all the time, like, you know, whereas now they let these guys languish and it's too late by the time they course correct with Austin. Yeah, we can all talk about and laugh now. The ringmaster was lame, but. He realized it right away. A lot of people around him realized it right away. They realized it right away. And they were kind of like, all right, we'll just come up with something better. And Mm -hmm. the performer did. They went with, now, I'm not saying that every idea that every current performer is going to come up with is good. That's not the case, okay? But it just goes to show that, hey, if you give these people some creative latitude, you're going to get some hits. You don't need a 100% hit rate, but by God, if you get three, that's all you need. 
You know, I, I couldn't help but think of, uh, and it was, it was a reminder. I couldn't help but think of life on planet earth watching this with, with all the things that have to go right with luck and chaos. You oh. have to have all these certain chemicals and a lightning strike. And if you're, if we're any closer to the sun, we burn up or if we're any farther, we're frozen. You have the moon, the certain distance away for the just precise gravity. And that's kind of how it is with, with Stone Cold. You have all these small things that add up to what he was like. He had to get fired from WCW because he, he needed to have that bitterness going into ECW to cut those promos that caught the attention of Vince McMahon. And, and it goes from there. What if his wife does not say anything about drink your tea before it's stone cold and he just ends up as Iceman? <laughs> does, does he get past that? Probably. But Iceman, Steve Austin, you know, Jim Ross yelling that is not as near as cool. What if Triple H doesn't go out for the curtain call he, and, and he goes on to King of the Ring? And even more so than that, what if Jake Roberts isn't his opponent at King of the Ring and we never get Austin 316? What if the neck injury never happens and, and we don't really get that, you know, a distance make the heart grow fonder type deal where it's like, this is one tough son of a bitch and we almost lost him for good. Mm -hmm. And then, as you've already pointed out, look at the opponents he had. Bret Hart, Mankind, Rock, and and possibly the greatest heel of all time, Vince McMahon. I mean, it's just, you had all these things that created a phenomenon. And if you take apart, it's kind of like, did you guys ever see uh, Chernobyl on HBO? Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. It's on my list because mm -hmm. you highly recommended it. Oh, yeah, dude, it's good. so good. It's like when they're describing what happened with this disaster. It's like, well, this safety this one little thing, you know, take that away. Oh, take this one away. It's just one thing after another until like the Jenga tower fell down until Chernobyl exploded. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, I, I had that I, same thought. Yeah. yeah. Well said. I had that same thought kind of going through my head watching that too. What if the, if the click curtain call doesn't happen at MSG, none of this happens. Austin I, potentially doesn't become the biggest star in the history of wrestling. If Shawn Michaels doesn't lose his smile, Austin doesn't work Bret Hart at WrestleMania 13. Yeah, and that whole period was defined, and I think I've used this term on the program before. Happy accidents, yeah. like you know, like things were just happened when you're like, oh my god, the WWE's like kind of screwed now, and somehow they took the negative and turned it into a positive. I mean, Montreal is the most shining example of that you're like, oh my god, what kind of stupidity is this? Mm -hmm. But it led to, as Justin said, the creation of the greatest heel character in the history of the business. I mean, how many other wrestling phenoms? had those kind of just odd chaos moments, happy accidents. I mean, look, Hogan was just a product of yes. kind of the moment. I was just going to say that it is so different than Hogan, where that was Vince McMahon totally understanding his audience, finding the right guy for it and executing perfection. It's Austin and Hogan's rise. Couldn't be more different in that regard. You're right. Cena was like, on his way potentially down or out of the company right like uh, that when he first started on the main roster they weren't real impressed with him and then stephanie heard him rapping and it turns up turn the whole thing around yes no if that doesn't happen potentially that would be different now he didn't he's the biggest star since austin and rock you know easily but not austin level but certainly a major star that maybe we don't get that yeah. uh yeah it's it's, it's I mean, tough to say. It's really fascinating to think about those coincidences, though, and, and how life would have worked out so much differently had that not happened. I it, there was there were some issues there at the timeline, too. I saw you had this in your notes, too, Kyle, mm -hmm. about how, you know, they talked about Austin 316 being created. And then it was like basically he was hot. They talked about the T-shirt and then the Owen thing the next year. And they didn't they had the clip of him and, and Brett working um they had a little bit of his segments from from like backstage on raw where he was attacking the uh, the camera guys and stuff but i mean overall like they they skipped a lot um so like justin do you know so he wins the king of the ring in june of 96 and you know they made it seem like he took off right after that and mm -hmm. certainly the catchphrase did the signs did start appearing but you would think that like if he really took off at that moment right after king of the ring 96 he would have a big match at SummerSlam, right? Yeah. Do you know that, who he yeah. worked at SummerSlam? Who? On the pre-show against Yokozuna. Yoko yeah. <laughs> so like y Yoko Yokozuna fell off the rope and he was just it, it, Austin was just window dressing for a fat gimmick. 
I had to look it up because I couldn't remember. I was like, wait, who did he work at SummerSlam? So like, I wouldn't got that either. Yeah. And so, yeah, it was Yokozuna. Like he had just won the King of the Ring. He was hot, but he hadn't been. It, I feel like the rise really started. Yeah, people were talking after King of the Ring, but I always go back to that that angle he did with Pillman with the ankle. Got really got people talking, and then of course, when Brett came back and answered the challenge, and then they, then they were off, and it was the Brett feud that put him over the top for sure. Yeah, I, wa- I wanted to ask you that because I, I know you, you know the Brett book well, and I think this is the case. But Austin was essentially Brett's hand chosen opponent for his return, was he not at Survivor Series '96? Yeah, they had worked in Africa on that Africa tour a few times uh, throughout early fall or summer. I, I believe they had worked some matches. Okay, and yeah. that was the whole key like to getting Austin going because it was that Survivor Series match and the reaction he got at MSG. You know, you started to get the little embers of, wow, pe- people are into Steve Austin. Mm-hmm. So that was like, I just, the... <laughs> The, the wrestling historian in me, like the longtime fan, was like, oh, no, go yeah. deep dive more on what happened after that with the Brett feud and the USA well, Canada stuff. Well, and they yeah, didn't really cover any of that. Yeah, I mean, of course, WWE's like, I said, well, yes. And then he kind of floundered. We had him in the lame duck pre-show <laughs> feud against Yokozuna. Yeah, they're not going to say that. But, you know, you're right. And look, we've got a lot of these documentaries come up, like you said. So who knows? We have a Brett one. The USA Canada feud may be covered in that one. Yeah. So, you know, you don't want to, like, rehash these things. True. Uh, you know, across multiple documentaries. So I'll give a pass there. But there was no mention here in this Austin documentary of the 99 injury mm-hmm. at all, which which kept him out for so long. Um, you know, or his business killing heel turn. Again, it's a WWE production, so they're not going to, and of course I added in business killing for effect, but that's true. Um, and then, you know, most notably, I know a lot of people were talking about this earlier in the week, like the domestic abuse. They kind of painted it like, he was going through some stuff after he left WWE. Um, obviously, they're not going because he's not going to do the documentary. Yeah, I mean, come on, that. there's no yeah. chance. That's yeah, there's. Happen. I mean, and, and to be fair, you know, people are going to want to call. Oh, freaking wrestling! You know, they can't. Nobody in any walk of life. I shouldn't say nobody, but most people are not going to agree to the documentary. You know, and and bring that up. They're yeah, they're just yeah. they're they're just not. So I was not surprised by that um, at all. Um, just one last thing. I don't know if you guys have think Justin in our text thread mentioned this Austin Mick Foley connection. Mm-hmm. You know, Mick was a talking head on this documentary. And I was thinking, it is crazy the connection between these two guys. You know, started out, you know, I, I know Mick had a cup of coffee in 1990 in WCW, but they became regulars around the same time in 91. Um, you know, had great three year runs there. By any objective measure, both were like real standouts for that promotion. And then they kind of un- both unceremoniously leave, go to ECW. Same time. Yeah. Same time well, frame. Same time frame. Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, they were, they were there together. I mean, cut probably some of the greatest promos in the history of this business. I mean, the, you know, the, they showed the Austin one. I mean, Foley, the Kane Dewey promo. Yeah. I mean, it's just an all, all time next level thing. Um, then they go to WWE around the same time together. And you think about it, Mick Foley wins his first world title the first week of 1999. Who was the guy who interfered in that match? Yeah. Uh, by the way, breaking glass. So yes. Anyways. That is the greatest pop in the history of this business. Not this fucking Triple H at MSG in 2002. <laughs> hey, let me ask you something about Triple H. So when they talked about the curtain call and him not winning King of the Ring, I, I got to get your takes on this because my I actually got my wife to watch most of this with me and she was pretty into it. So that tells you it's good because she'll never watch wrestling. Yeah. But when these Triple H comments on, I turned to her and said something and I, I really am dying to know what you thought. So Triple H said that, you know, yeah, maybe he was a little mad when he found out he wasn't going to be winning King of the Ring. But at the same time, he was like, we got something really special here with Steve Austin. And he was really happy for him. Justin, you buy that? Well, no, but, <laughs> but, but, but he recovered from it when talking, when they were talking about uh, Austin 316 at the King of the ring. And he was like, Oh, part of me was like, no, that should be me. But also I wouldn't have been able to cut that promo. <laughs> yeah, he did. Yo, that was a rare moment of, um, Oh, what's the word I'm looking for here. I don't know. Humbleness. 
Yeah, yeah. humbleness from Triple H. Yes, <laughs> but yeah, what he said. I mean, obviously, I'm sure he was pretty pissed off or whatever. But yeah, I think 25 years later, he thinks so. But at the time, I don't buy for one second that he oh, wasn't just re- living about it. Yeah, remember when I don't they, think he uh, was saying, "Well, Steve Austin's pretty special. This is going to work out." Like, come on, come man, on. Man. Know, I wouldn't have been saying that. <laughs> well, to be fair, you know. I mean, I don't weep for Triple H, okay? I mean, the guy was brought back and won the Intercontinental title not long after. Yeah. yeah. Remember? I mean, it, it's not like, you know, oh, he really, you know, he really had to fight so hard to get back in the mix. It's like, <laughs> he was off TV for basically the summer. Yeah, yeah. yeah he um, beat Merrill, right? Yes. Mark Merrill? Yeah. Yes. That was when I was, like, not watching WWF at all. Mm. I just wanted to real quick to... to kind of put a pin on the the stone cold mankind or austin foley that kyle brought up the, i think the reason you really brought it, i think what i was what i don't know i i knew it but i'd forgotten about it the thing that's really interesting and what are oh, the yeah. chances is mick foley was at steve austin's tryout to become a wrestler yes that's what nuts. are the freaking chances of that <laughs> yes that's so crazy yeah that's yeah. nuts man and we and, and we we should do a podcast on gentleman Chris Adams, by the way. Put that on the list. <laughs> Connection there too. Yeah. So so you know, he's at Steve Austin's tryout, and what, 10 years later, they're having uh one of the very few Kyle Ross rated five star matches. Mm, yeah. Let us see you're paying attention. Yes. <laughs> God, I love that match so much. So yeah, we'll we'll be talking in the weeks ahead about probably most of these because I am looking forward to watching all of them. Uh the I think the Piper one this weekend should be really good as well. I also really enjoyed the Most Wanted Treasure show. I don't know if you guys watched that at all. It's an it's an entertaining show. I'd recommend that as well. I'm into the memorabilia stuff though. Obviously, looking behind me if you're watching the video feed. But uh, I I think that's worth the watch too. If you didn't see the Most Wanted Treasures deal, good stuff. Check it out. So I saw it. I saw it. I liked it. I it was a. I just don't like nerds turning down almost ten thousand dollars for another dude's shirt <laughs> i mean i wonder how much of that is staged you know that's got it it's got to yeah be staged. i'm looking for the episode where they're hunting down flair's robes though that should be pretty cool so i i, I did not watch because i did not like the commercial i told you with triple h stephanie with triple h, do you know this guy i'm they're like not, oh, they're not on no. it that much though okay you should uh, watch you should watch right, it. i'll good. give it a chance then yeah you should definitely watch it so yeah check that out guys um also, as I said at the top of the show, download the Locker Room app. Join us. It's going to be call-in style, very free-flowing conversation. We want people on the show. We've been talking about taking call-ins for a while. This is going to let us do that through the Locker Room app. So, yeah, if you have if you have an Apple device, look up Locker Room, download it, follow us at TRP Kyle and at R Drosty D R O S T E, and we'll be starting that weekly starting next week. So. Uh, yeah, you find us on Twitter uh, at TRP Kyle at Top Rope Nation. I'm at Ryan Drosty there. Justin is at Justin Joint. Uh, join the Facebook Pro Wrestling Discussion Group. Search Top Rope Nation Pro Wrestling Discussion. Would love to have you in there for our daily conversations on what's going on in in the wrestling business. And as always, leave us that five star rating. Leave us leave us a written review so we can read it on the air and subscribe. Whether you're on YouTube or one of the podcasting platforms any any last thoughts guys before we hit the road oh i kind of want to say something about this trash bag situation but (laughs) oh boy how do you do that to mickey james how do you do that i had the tweet that uh you know she doesn't have the title but uh she does have a trash bag from wwe so Maybe she should show up on AEW Dynamite and say, you know, this trash bag represents that booking in that company up north, brother. (laughs) (laughs) Would be so great. (laughs) A top five moment in this industry if she did that. Um, Yeah, I don't know. Other than that, uh, Daniel Bryan, a man who went to every doctor under the sun to get cleared, apparently now does not like wrestling anymore. Oh, that was heartbreaking. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm standing at the ring at the main event of WrestleMania. I'm like, is this, do I like this? <laughs> what did he say? Like, that <laughs> was amazing. And by the way, he kind of confirmed something we said on the WrestleMania post show. That uh, three way idea, I think he was fighting it. No, I don't want to be in the three way, Vince. Mm-hmm. Get in there, pal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Hey, like we said, we had, we had jam packed agenda tonight. I think we got to most of it looking at our notes. Uh, we did. I'm, yeah. I'm sure we're going to have plenty to talk about next week, whether it's the locker room show or the flagship show at the end of next week. I can't uh, wait to talk about that raw. I saw, you know, um, people were sending out clips because it was the anniversary yesterday uh, of the show. As, as we of the 97 raw that we're doing yeah. for classics. Yeah. Yeah, that, that will be the show next week. That yes. was a red hot angle. Just so people are clear, it's the angle um, where Austin attacks Brett in the ambulance and beats his ass and stuff like that. Just a great piece of business. I'm looking forward to that. I look forward to all our classic shows, but this was like one of the most memorable Raws for me during that era. I think on Wrestling with Shadows, Brett called it like the best Raw that had ever happened up to that point or something. He said something like it was one of the best shows they ever did, I think, on Wrestling with Shadows. So we're going to be reliving it. You'll get the teaser next Friday on our regular feeds, on the podcast feeds. You'll hear the first 15 minutes of the show. I'm sure we'll probably go 90 minutes on that like we always do on these deep dives of these historical shows. We do that every month. It's a bonus show over on Patreon. Check out patreon.com slash top rope nation. A, a, little breaking, a little breaking news just came in. Um, uh oh, yeah. Uh, just announced. I'm withdrawing from the Top Rope Nation Super League podcast. <laughs> <laughs> it's over. Oh, well, maybe when they add a Android support, we can add you back in. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right. So good show, guys. Good to talk, Justin. Good to see you in person last weekend. Hopefully, we can do that more again coming yeah, up. Definitely. All right, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. We'll catch you all next time. Have a great weekend. Peace. Bye.